hello, welcome and good evening uh, to this um, talk on the Ogwen Valley. Um, it's the first time I've done a, a Facebook Live event uh, streaming it through uh, Zoom. So it was a bit of a trial. Um, and I know some of you in the audience tonight and I won't know others. So welcome those of you who don't know me, um, who have seen any of my talks. Um, I am um, going to talk tonight about the geological background, some of the glacial history of the Ogwen Valley, and to summarise everything that is really special about the Ogwen Valley, I'll talk about Commidwell as a national nature reserve, why it's a national nature reserve, some of the features that we get there. Um, there's quite a bit of background that I put in. I think it's important to put context into these presentations. Um, so um, there will be uh, a bit of science that goes with it. So bear with all that at the beginning. But those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Jim Langley and I run an educational consultancy. Uh, I lead groups and guide groups and run training events in North Wales. I run teacher training events. Uh, I work with young groups of students as well. So I teach them about the geography and the ecology on field trips, work with primary groups. Um, in the summer, I'm generally in the Alps um, leading uh, trekking groups. But I also uh, run training courses for outdoor instructors and people who want to learn more about the natural world. So I run CPD courses for mountain training. I'm an international mountain leader. And I've recently uh, followed the Areri Ambassador Scheme, so I, I got the Gold Award, which is really interesting. If any of you are interested in learning more about Snowdonia, it's a really interesting process. And it came on live in November last year. So uh, to learn all about the culture and the history of Snowdonia and the people um, and the industry, as well as the nature and the geology, it's a really, really worthwhile process for those of you who love Areri and Snowdonia. Um, bit of context where are we well Wales uh, part of Britain British Isles on the um, western side of Europe and Ireland North Wales uh, well Wales is to the west of the UK North Wales from Bangor uh, to the south here you have Bangor the Menai Strait the Isle of Anglesey and this here is a, a map of the Ogwen Valley so as a, as a river valley, as a, as a catchment or a drainage basin, that is the Ogwen Valley. So you've got the watershed around here, comes up over the Carnedai, the high mountains, the Carnedai, the Ogwen Valley and the Ogwen Lake itself and the Glidderai Mountains here, Marshall and Mauer and the dam. So the Ogwen Valley itself is a big river valley draining some very high rainfall areas um, of North Wales. So there's a picture of Trevan. This is Abon Bodesi, which flows down past Bryn Poith, which is the mountain rescue base, um, and then joins the Ogwen right here. And then uh, Nant Gwen uh, Gov, which comes down from come Trevan, past Little Willie's campsite, joins the Ogwen. And right here, Pontred Goch is the boundary of the watershed between the Conwy Valley, which flows out to the east and then here we flow down into Llenogwen through the mountains and down Nant Francon and eventually coming down to Aberogwen by Penryn Castle. So that's the geological or the, 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 the fluvial basin of uh, the Ogwen Valley but we seem we, we look at this whole area the high mountains as the Ogwen Valley itself. Um, just to put some more context on it, this 20 second video illustrates the origins of the rocks that created uh, the, uh, the mountains that we see today. So a lot of the rocks have this really violent origin. 450 million years ago, I'll we'll talk about the geological processes, but 450 million years ago, we got these huge volcanic eruptions in this shallow sea environment placid um, volcanic eruptions, but they're just, uh, you know, they're flowing lavas, but they're very, very violent form. So that really illustrates 
the the origin of the geological story. But the landscape we see today isn't, it's got volcanic rocks, but also some other sedimentary rocks and some volcanic rocks, but these aren't volcanoes as such, but they're made of volcanic material, which were then lifted into the mountains that we that 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 we see today and then it was shaped by the, the the glaciation so it begins in the middle ordovician era 458 million years ago and um wales was part of this proto-european continent called avalonia somewhere around there which is quite a long way 60 degrees south of the equator scotland was part of laurentia which is a proto north american plate um, near the equator so this is a very long period of time ago but the evidence of where we've come from are from the fossil records that we have um, that we we see in in our mountains so these fossils i'll talk more about fossils in a bit but there's not huge amounts of fossils because of the volcanic activity but where there are sediments laid down in the sea then we get these impressions of these fossils and so that's part of the evidence to suggest where we've come from and where our story began. The continents were moving um, and England and Wales and Ireland were moving up from 60 degrees south of the equator to 20 or so degrees south of the equator and it basically collided into Laurentia, so into Scotland. So this happened around 420 million years ago in the Silurian era. So that ocean disappeared, the two continents collided. What's interesting, um, during the, the, the kind of Roman time in uh, Britain, the Celtic tribes um, that, that lived in the, in the area, then in North Wales, the Celtic tribe were called the Ordovites and the Silurs are in the south of Wales. So these two names have been given to those two geological periods. The Cambrian era is given to Cymru as well. So Wales has certainly got a footprint in its, in the, the, the kind of development of geological understanding. And, and so these, the fossil records from the, the Ordovites and the Silur and those geological rocks were, were um, discovered in Wales. So it's got quite an interesting link geologically. These, this photo, and there's a couple of other photos courtesy of Paul Gannon, who's written the Rock Trails books, um, this shows what happens when the two continents collide and eventually, so those continents collide and during those, that time we get this thing called an orogeny, two continents colliding, the rocks are folded and faulted and you can see these bends in these rocks here. So Snowden made up of these lower bends which are called synclines. And these are the volcanic rocks. And then below them are sandstone, so sedimentary rocks of the same era, but older uh, formations. And then below those, we have these Cambrian grits, 500 and odd million years um, old, but they come on this what's called an anticline around the Harlech Dome in the Rinolds. And then again, we have another syncline, Cad Idris. Snow is really handy. When you look at Snowden here, you can see the evidence of these down bends, these synclines on Snowden. And as well at Clogwindarathi, you can see the massive uh, syncline that we get along here. There's a shear along here and there's a um, there's faulting that's happened as well as this, this bend. But Clogwindarathi and the Idwal syncline are all from the same um, geological process but it's evidence of this mountain building phase so what do we owe all this understanding um, to and it, it's one of the, the the kind of concepts of plate tectonics is one of the great kind of discoveries and revolutions from the 20th century and the idea that the earth is separated into these interlocking but independent tectonic plates and it's at the margins of these plates where we get all the activity, namely volcanoes and earthquakes. So I found this off the internet. I haven't got a reference for it, I'm sorry, but this illustrates where the active volcanoes are on earth at the moment. And there's about 50 eruptions at any time on the planet. Um, Etna was 
uh, erupting in the last couple of weeks. Um, but it, they don't erupt all the time, but they're very active. So not all of these are active today, but they're part of an active uh, process. This illustrates where all the earthquakes are on Earth. And that is where the plate boundaries are. So you can see how the plate boundaries are really uh, where we find all this activity, this tectonic activity. So some of these plates are separating and some of them are colliding. So the colliding plates are these red ones. So if we take, for instance, the, the Indian uh, plate crashing into the Asian plate and with the Himalayas being formed. So that's a colliding or converging plate boundary. The separating or diverging plates, think about the, the mid-Atlantic ridge. Um, Iceland is part of the sea floor, which uniquely has been elevated due to a hotspot above the, the, the sea floor, but it is the sea floor, Iceland is at the sea floor, but it's unique in the world because it's the only place on earth that the sea floor is seen above um, sea level. But that's separating. So these are spreading plates. And then we have conservative ones where you sliding along at school, we learned about the San Andreas Fault in California down here. Um, the structure of the earth, so the core is solid and then the outer core is liquid and they're um, iron. Then we have the mantle, which is about 60% of the earth's volume and the very upper layer of the mantle um, is which on which the, the, the crust moves around on this weak layer, the asthenothea um, is, is a weak layer that the crust, the hard brittle bit that we live on, um, floats around on. So there's oceanic crust and there's continental crust. The reason I'm just giving you all this background is because North Wales has got some incredible rock formations and, and the Ogwen Valley. So it's worth knowing about that. And the, the, the two layers of the, the crust, um, an upper and lower layer are called the lithosphere. So looking at the mantle itself, um, there are great convection currents. So the mantle is solid, but soft. And there are these great convection currents that cycle this rock. Um, that bring the heat from the core up to the surface. And as a rock comes to the surface, it drops in pressure, reduces the melting temperature, and the rock becomes molten magma and erupts to the surface as volcanoes. And in so doing, they create this new plate which moves along here, like on the conveyor belt, until it reaches to another continental plate, like a continental plate. So continental or oceanic crust, or that plate, as it comes up and wells up, creates rock features um, in basalt, which we might recognize hexagonal columns, um, Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. This is in um, the southern coast of Iceland, Blackwater Beach. And you get these hexagonal columns in basalt. You also get, um, basalt which forms in the sea and it forms these rounded lumps which are known as pillows and an example of these we see in the boulder field in the back of Kamidwal, which have come down from the top of the devil's kitchen and have landed and are placed where they are the, the boulders in the back have, are from this origin which this photo from Hawaii illustrates a formation of these pillows so they're, they're in the shallow sea and they form this skin and they cool quickly. So this skin that we see around here as they crack, as they, uh, as they, they cool, you get those, those cooling cracks. But these pillows, another bit of lava will come on over the top and form another pillow. And so these, these features are, are, are superb, but they're um, present in, in the Ogwen Valley. So oceanic crust is mainly basalt bit of chemistry, pour in silica and dense. I will have other slides that re illustrate this. You might have heard of andesitic lavas. Uh, we get intrusive lavas as well. Um, but that crust is no more than 10 kilometers thick 
in most parts of the world, it's six kilometers thick. It's really hot, 1200 degrees, and it's rich in iron and magnesium. And you might have heard of rock minerals called olivine and pyroxene, and they become dark in color because of the minerals in them. So basalts and then gabbros and dolerites, and I'll talk about extrusive and intrusive shortly. So this convection current brings magma up to the surface and it spreads out along this conveyor belt from this mid-ocean ridge and both sides, that ocean crust goes on this conveyor belt. So ocean crust is formed and then it goes along here and it gets recycled and melts and becomes part of the mantle again. So it's created and it's recycled and destroyed. Continents are not destroyed, but ocean crust is. We, we'll talk about the continental rocks in a bit, but um, ocean crusts get destroyed no more than 200 million years old, whereas continents can be 3 billion years old. And continents as well, um, think about the Himalayas being eight and a half thousand meters above sea level. You've got to have some very big roots to stop those falling over. So this continental crust can be up to 45 kilometers thick. And they always float on top of oceanic crust because they're less dense, relatively less dense. They're, they're lighter. So ocean crust subducts, goes underneath, melts, gets recycled and continents don't. So we can see this um, process called subduction, where it comes down here and that oceanic crust comes down there, drags seawater, and it mobilizes or it, it creates these vol this volcanic activity here. So continental crust can be created in subduction through these volcanic um, processes, but also along the trench here, a lot of the ocean crust is scraped off and accretes. And a great example of that is at Nubra Warren, where you've got these pillow lavas, part of the ocean crust, which have been scraped off and left on the edge of the continent. So new uh, accretion um, is a process, but Anglesey, again, I'm not a geologist by background. Uh, I'm interested in the subject, but it's, it's good to, to, North Wales is phenomenal for, for all of this. So we have, the process of North Wales, so we have our volcanic rocks being caused by vol volcanoes, uh, by an earth tremors, but the continents colliding during the Silurian. And these volcanic eruptions, and we get all these rock types I'm going to talk about now in, in the Ogwen Valley. We get the lava that comes to the surface is known as extrusive. So it extrudes onto the surface. Rocks that, volcanic lava that doesn't come to the surface, but cools in say a, a, a dill or a, a, a sill or a dike will be known as intrusive. But of the extrusive rocks, we get lava flows. We get a pyroclastic flow and that name pyro from pyrex, fire, clastic means pebbles. It's a burning cloud of, of uh, gas and ash and rock. Uh, superheated. Um, we also get um, this volcanic dust that falls to the ground or ash and it's known as tuff. So climbers amongst you, you, you might think about rhyolitic tuff in the Ogwen Valley, um, various names given to that, but tuff is from volcanic ash which is settled and it could be in the air, it could be in the sea and there are different grades of all these kind of rocks. Climbing on the east face of Trivan, you can see these squiggly lines. This is rhyolite. This is a, a, a rock, um, a volcanic lava, which is called, and we get these, these rocks. And these layers are known as flow banding. So these are um, both taken on Trivan. We get siliceous nodules, so big silica-rich nodules in rocks. There's one in, in the Ogden Valley, and this one, on the north ridge of Trivan, as, you, as you're climbing up, 
you get these fantastic examples of these silica rich rocks, this rhyolitic rock, very, very rich in silica. Um, I think the, the process of the formation of these is um, th those nodules develop after they've been erupted um, and they, they take time. It's di um, diagenesis, I believe. It, it, there's a process, it's thought. One of the thinking uh, thoughts behind it is diagenesis. But you also get columnar jointing in rhyolite as well. So you sometimes get this flow banding but you sometimes get these cooling cracks when the, the, the rocks cooled in a very perfect condition. But rhyolite, because it's so explosive in the eruptions, it's, it's very rare to find columnar jointing um, in, in the world. But they make continental crust, so they're volcanic rocks which make continental crust. There's the columnar jointing. I mentioned tuff. So this is a welded tuff in Comidwal and the small outcrops of it. Um, the eruption, this came from near Mol Hebog, but it's in Comidwal. Um, so it's exploded from a volcano a number of kilometers away and that burning cloud of gas and ash has spewed out at 300 odd kilometers an hour. And they've melted rocks in their path and they and they just melted them and fused them into this tuff, into this matrix. So these hard lumps that you see here uh, are, are rocks which have been picked up by this burning cloud of ash and then fixed into this, this um, burning, you know, burning uh, cloud of, of pyroclastic rock. Um, a breccia, you may have heard of a breccia, and you can see here some really large lumps of rock here. So this is very coarse. So again, volcanic lava or the ash. Um, rocks would have been um, grabbed from the side of the volcanic vents and spewn into the air and then it's formed, it's, it's landed as a big mass of, um, of this, this matrix, this, this lava with these big lumps in it. So again, you may have heard of breccia. But when the ash is very fine and it, it falls into the sea, you get these very, very fine ash fall tufts. And the evidence here of cross bedding indicates a marine environment or a, an aquatic environment where they've, they've fallen down, they've settled, but there's been turbid movements which have caused this thing process called cross bedding. So continental crust is granitic, it's rich in silica, it's light, and if it's extrusive, you get rhyolite. Um, it's much cooler than um, basalt, and it's got different minerals, feldspar and quartz. It's, it, and so you get extrusive. If it comes out of a vol volcanic vent, it's rhyolite. If it's intrusive, chemically it's the same as it's, but it's granite, which we're much more familiar with. So here the contents have collided, and to illustrate that process is a magnificent, uh, hopefully you've all been up Trivan. Um, there's the Heather Terrace and you can see the line that you walk up Heather Terrace is an ascending line but uh, below it this, the snow again illustrates that the nature of the rock here very, looks very different the way the snow has settled. From up here the much more grand um, resistant rock that you've got there and you've got this outcrop on the southern summit here. So if you look from the end on, there's Heather Terrace, but that line, that weakness actually follows on the route that we walk up for Milestone Car Park. So if we combine that, we see that the layer, I showed the photo of the syncline earlier and the tilting, this illustrates um, by this weak layer of sedimentary salt stone. So that would have been laid down horizontally. The mountain building processes have tilted and uplifted those rocks, or those layers. And if we take a profile across Trevan, what we see, the volcanic rocks, so I've mentioned tufts and breccias. So the west face, you've got tufts and breccia. Those tufts could be coarse, they could be ashfall, they could be um, different gradings, but they're volcanic rocks. And then we have this 
rock which is called intrusive rhyolite. So that's the resistant when the, the image of the climbing. Rhyolite is an extrusive volcanic lava, but the nature of the volcanic eruption uh, means that some of that lava doesn't quite get out of the vent, so it cools a bit like toothpaste and it would just harden up and, and imagine the old toothpaste signal where you got the colors and that would squidge and, and create the cross, um, the flow banding. Um, and so rhyolite, it, it's, it's understood that not all of it is extrusive. Volcanic rocks again, tuffs and breccias and sandstone. So that's a great cross section. And when you climb up again, the next time you go up to Ravan, You'll, you'll notice the different um, features. Some of you will know, uh, you'll be familiar with the rocks and some of the, the features that I've, I've shown in previous photos there. But when you're going up Heather Terrace, you're, you're realizing that you're on this weak, weak layer. So summarize again, we're gonna move on from geology in a minute, but we get basalts, these are the extremes, basalts and rhyolites, they're the two extremes in terms of our magma. I'll briefly go over this now we have basalt here and they're extruded from the surface and you get rhyolite small number of crystals because they cool quickly if it cools intrusively basalt with big crystals is gabbro with rhyolite big crystals is granite so intrusive extrusive we're not going to worry about the ones in between because we don't really have those in the Elgin Valley but here um, basalts and gabbros are dark colour, olivine, and a small amount of quartz, whereas rhyolite and granite have large amounts of quartz. And again, this just illustrates the chemistry of them, but big difference is green, iron, so it's heavy, manganese, calcium, great for flowers, which I'll talk about in a bit, but here the amount of silica and rhyolite. So those two, are really, the amount of silica is really important in rocks. And then this shows the temperature of basaltic eruptions and how cool the rhyolite is relatively. And so it's much more thick and resistant and hence more explosive. And again, these are the two extremes. So the runny basalt to the explosive rhyolite. And here we are on Cogwinner Person in Cumblas. You can see there's a there's distinct geological boundary right there, dark rock with white lichens and pale rock. So these are silica rich rocks of rhyolite above and below their um, rich rocks, mafic or magnesium and iron rich, um, extrusive igneous basalts and tufts. So if you're you know, climbing, then the rhyolite is, is really, in North Wales, fantastic for climbing on, um, but you do get lots of these, um, base rich rocks as well, but not, not as much as the rhyolite. So within this, we have evidence of fossils, but not a lot because of the volcanic activity. So this is a group just up into Idwal, and you can see a layer where there are impressions that have been left. Um, just in a, in a layer of this, um, I found this a number of years ago. It's not easy to find fossils in North Wales. Um, that's an example on the way up to Cumclid, um, on the following the river up onto a garn. Um, so Darwin and, and the boulders, it's really important to, to talk about the significance of, of um, Charles Darwin really in our understanding of the natural world and his association with North Wales. So Darwin, visited Camidwal in 1831 with a geologist from Cambridge University, the leading geologist of the time called Adam Sedgwick. And they were looking for fossils of marine seashells high up in um, Cumclid uh, up on a garden here. And seeing these fossils led them to believe that the rocks must have been formed by an ancient ocean and were later, later uplifted by the forces within the Earth's crust. So this is their you know, the, the few people starting to get this um, geological story um, and trying to piece it together. Um, following his trip here from Cambridge University, he went off on the Beagle for five years and he witnessed 
icebergs in Tierra del Fuego carving off into the ocean. He saw this glaciated landscape. And then when he returned to North Wales in 1842 and he did a geological journey, he noticed for the first time these erratic boulders. And in his memoirs, he wrote a quote and he said, um, neither he nor, nor Sedgwick saw a trace of the wonderful glacial phenomenon all around us, yet the phenomenon are so conspicuous that, as I declared in a paper published many years afterwards, a house burned down by fire did not tell its story more plainly did, than did this valley. So it, it's interesting. I just find that we've got this connection to um, the, the geological background and the, the identifying fossils. And but North Wales is so special for that and so accessible as well. So moving on to glaciation, North Wales has been heavily glaciated for the past two and a half or 2.6 million years in the Pleistocene. And that ice age, we are still in that ice age, there's been five in the Earth's history, we're still in an ice age, um, but we're in a relatively warm spell. So these glaciations uh, follow colder and warmer spells. Uh, and in that 2.6 million years in the Pleistocene glaciation, there's been around 18 to 20 glacial events in Britain. And they create this incredible landscape where you get these steep aspects here. And if I show this um, diagram, just take a second there, you've got the Ogwen Valley here, Nant Francon Valley here, and Bethesda. And these little u shape um, they're like horse hooves here. Can you see there? They limit, delimit the features that we, we call corries or cums. So this one from um, kind of Davis, David going up to Llewellyn here, we've got this feature here and they, they kind of point northerly. So this is the edge of that horseshoe or that U-shape and its aspect is pointing north. So snow accumulates in the colder northern aspects where the sun doesn't reach. Um, North Wales had two types of, of glaciers, alpine glaciers, on like the example for a garden, again, where you get this amphitheater shape hollow. And we also had continental glaciers. The world has got two ice sheets, but um, ice caps are, are smaller versions of an ice sheet. So imagine 18,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, Snowdonia would have looked like this just the high summits above the ice sheet. So all the valleys around North Wales were covered in, in thick ice. So Trevan was just above the height of, and the glitters were above, they were sticking out above the, uh, the ice. And they came not from an ice sheet, like the two sheets that we have in Antarctica and Greenland, but from an ice cap centered on the Mignite Moor, the source of the River Conway would have been about 1500 meters in depth and that big ice cap had the power and the force to push valley glaciers like this one in the election in the valley in switzerland to force those down these long valleys and you can see this this would have come from an ice cap whereas you see these smaller tributary glaciers the alpine glaciers up here glaciers move by sliding along the base or by this ice deformation, this internal plastic flow, but we're not gonna get into the science for that now. But to illustrate that, you've got elephant foot glacier up in the Northeast of Greenland, uh, and it flows out here. You can see the way it, that plastic flow movement into the Roma, Roma Lake, I think it's called. Um, just an incredible example of, a, of, of internal plastic flow. So glaciers erode by two processes, really simple, and yet their effect is dramatic. So they either abrade or they pluck. So abrasion, a bit like sandpaper, um, being rubbed and smoothed, but plucking, ice, imagine going to the freezer tonight and putting your hand on the inside of that freezer and your hand would freeze to that metal, it's so cold. If you take your hand away, it might pull the skin away and that's plucking. So glasses erode by abrading and plucking. 
and no greater example, again, Nant Francon Valley, you've got the abrasion occurring here. So the ice was moving in from right to left and it hits this resistant obstacle. The ice at the base of the glacier is forced up and it causes melting, pressure melting. It's got all the rocks, the rock flower and the debris. It rubs and rubs and rubs and abrades this upper Stoss surface. And then as soon as the pressure is released, it refreezes, recontacts the rock and plucks away. So this feature is called a Roche Moutonne. And it just illustrates how glaciers erode. The, the word Roche Moutonne comes, I think it was from the aristocrats in France and Switzerland, whereas you've got this, this kind of roll here and this smooth wig. Um, and the rolls and the wig were, were kind of shaped by um, sheep's fat, mutone. And uh, Benedict Saussure, who was a, a kind of cartographer and he invented the, uh, the Tour Mont Blanc uh, back in 1780s. Um, he was trying to link up the, the, the passes. He, he's a fascinated kind of person, intellectual and uh, had many, many interests. Um, he came up with the idea that these looked like uh, a wig like that. So the Roche Moutonne, and so the, the, that's where the, the name originates from. You also get rocks which are carried and dragged across hard surfaces. So these lines, these parallel lines here, and you can see them again here, these parallel lines across the face of the rock are known as striations. So rocks, um, glaciers can erode on the minute scale, but also on that bigger scale where you've got um, the Roche Moutonne. And other features that we associate um, with glaciation, you've got this big feature here, a cum, a corrie, a cirque, or a tarn, many names for them, um, created by plucking of the head wall, and then that material is abraded, and there's a rotational movement, again, physics, and you often get this, this low um, hollow, uh, which we would then see with a lake inside because there's a threshold or a lip that could be with moraine or, or, or a rock lip. Um, they don't always have them, um, but that's a formation of a corrie. So that's one of the glacial features we get in North Wales. The next one isn't in North Wales, and it's when we're allowed to visit the Alps, but that feature, that narrow knife edged ridge, as on, on Snowden here in Kribgor, is you've got an arete. And there are many ridges, um, grade one, two, three in, in North Wales. Um, other glacial features that we get in North Wales, some great examples of them around the world. So we have here the Matterhorn and the Don de Heron in the Swiss. Valet again, uh, Mont Blanc de Chéon, these beautiful pyramidal shapes. Penarola when can appear to be a pyramidal peak from certain views. Snowden is, is a pyramidal peak. Um, and they form when there are, are glacial mount, um, alpine glaciers forming back to back. Nant Flancon, the iconic um, textbook example of a glacial trough or a u-shaped valley again caused by that streaming long valley glacier wasn't uh, has a stream in it now but it's known as a misfit stream because that stream that river certainly didn't cut this big wide valley so it's known as a misfit stream in the glacial environment the feature we're looking at here is is a small cum which is now left hanging high above this valley. So um, either hanging valley or hanging cum, um, they're glacial features. So again, less erosive force from the Alpine glacier, but the big force here, the example is down in Patagonia. Um, this is the gray glacier being met by Alpine glaciers here and here, but this is fed from the Southern ice field um, in Patagonia. These two features, this, this ridge line dropping off here is the same as this ridge line being cut off or truncated. So there are lots of these features, uh, again, in a gl lake glaciated landscape. 
And also you get lakes which fill the valley. It's only a shallow lake, six or eight foot in most parts, um, known as a ribbon lake, which is either dammed, it's, so it's a depression in the valley, or it's, um, there's material which has stopped it from um, flowing. So it's been contained, but um, ribbon lake. And then we get all this material which has been transported. Great example in Switzerland again of this glacial material we call boulder clay, or modern word is glacial till. So all these great big boulders, these boulders and the clay matrix, a descriptive term. And down at Aberogwen, we get a dark color with rocks in here, and then a lighter color. This has got small sediments in there, but there's some big rocks. This red material has a different origin to this gray material. And if you studied the rocks here, you'd see that they were, there were slates, there was rhyolite, there was tuff, and they're rocks that have come from North Wales, from Snowdonia. So they've been transported down and dumped in the Manai Strait. The lithology, the origin of this, is from Scotland. So that glacial history that we've got is, we've got the mel melding of two glaciers, um, Big, big, there's an ice sheet that came down from Scandinavia across Scotland, across the North Wales coast, and then Wales had its own ice sheets. Just down the road from where I live, you've got an exact, a brilliant example of, of this um, glacial till. Features of deposition we get in, in uh, the Ogwen Valley uh, moraines. Um, this is an example in the Yorkshire Dales. This is a, a dark gray rock on a limestone on the pavement. So these rocks have obviously been transported and dumped on here. And it's the glaciation that's created this. Um, they've come from Northumberland, the Narbut um, boulders. They've been transported up into the Yorkshire Dales. And then as the glaciers melt, they've been deposited. North Wales has examples of erratics as well. So this is in Commidwall. So there's lots of all this evidence all over of, of this glacial environment. So the third section of my talk is looking at Commidwall. The National Nature Reserve, it's such an iconic, beautiful gate. Joe Roberts designed this gate with the geological feature of the syncline in there and Nant Frank on the U-shaped valley there. So he's done a beautiful job and that gate has lasted so, so well. Um, so a little bit of information about Commidwall. It's so synonymous. It's, it's my favourite place to teach. It's so accessible. It's, it's got all sorts of, of um, features and aspects of the natural world. Um, it's, it's, a, it's fantastic for recreation as well as science, as well as conservation and, and land management. It's, it just really is quite a unique place. And it was designated as the very first National Nature Reserve in 1954. This is the first nature reserve in Wales. Snowdonia became a national park in 51. Commidwall was Wales's first National Nature Reserve, 54. There are 68, I think, or maybe 70 now, National Nature Reserves in Wales. Three features that have made it uh, the National Nature Reserve. Unique geology, it's got some rare Arctic alpine flowers, rare for Britain that is, and its lake is very low in nutrients. In the 60s and 70s, grazing um, exclosure plots were, were uh, created by Bangor University. Um, the lake Llynidwal is an international wetland of importance. Wales has got lots of Ramsar sites. With such a damp maritime environment, we've got some really important bogs and, and wet environments, uh, some really interesting species and, and communities of flowers. Um, uh, the d I think is a Ramsar. It's a place in Iran where there was a convention in 1971 um, looking at wetlands of importance. So the lake has got an international designation as well as our national designations. Every national nature reserve is a site of special scientific interest. You may know them as triple SIs. These little green dots are triple SIs, and this is one huge triple SI, Areri or Snowden 
triple SI, that all the way around, that is one triple SI. Within the Areri triple SI, you've got Snowden National Nature Reserve, Commidwell National Nature Reserve, Cum Glass, Kravnant National Nature Reserve, and uh, the Abba Falls Woodlands, four National Nature Reserves within one site of special scientific interest. So it bit of kind of background to conservation and land uh, uh, protected sites really. Um, the limit of the National Nature Reserve starts at the outflow of Clinidwell and it goes out up onto the viewpoint looking down Mount Francon um, around. So this is the ridge going up to a garden. So that's northeast ridge. So it goes way past into Cumquion, up onto the ridge, a garden, down Clinicoon, up, up towards Glidavour, and then past Cumcanavion, past the Gribbin Ridge, and down to Clinbochluid before it returns there. So the National Nature Reserve is, is quite a big boundary. But the iconic landscape that we see is we have this geological feature that the syncline here. So all the rocks on this side of the syncline are bending in this direction. And the slabs, volcanic tuff, fine ash, they're really well illustrated here in this uh, diagram. You can see the syncline, also all those that, that um, volcanic or those sedimentary layers as well as volcanic layers. So things are really fascinating um, in terms of uh, habitats in, in Commidual National Nature Reserve are, for me, the, the community, and there are various sites where you get these communities of Arctic alpine flowers. So some of them are Arctic in, or, in, in origin. So this is the tufted saxifrage, which is an Arctic species. It lives very happily up in Iceland, Greenland, Norway, um, but it's, I think it's the most southerly population in Britain, maybe in the world. I'm not sure um, in, if that is true, but it's certainly around the found around the, the polar region. In the next couple of weeks, the purple saxifrage will be bursting into flower. Um, maybe early March. It's quite a cold at the moment. At the wind, the winter at the moment is quite cold, so it might delay the flowering. But sometimes you get the flowering in in the end of February. Again, you can see in Britain, here we are, you've got Norway, you've got Mongolia um, here, and you've got like Baikal uh, in um, Siberia, right around to northern Alaska, Canada, Greenland. And it's actually found the most northerly flowering plant in the world in a little bay in northern Greenland. And yet here it is in North Wales flowering quite happily. I think it's found in Pembrokeshire as well in, in a site. And, uh, so, but it, it's just, uh, and, and Cadedris, and, but it's fascinating, this, this distribution of these Arctic species. Another species which has got this circumpolar uh, population are Sown Lilies. Very iconic to North Wales. It's, it's uh, named Lloydia. Um, we still know as Lloydia. We've got this lovely association with it as a as a Welsh flower. Um, spider wort, it has been called in the past. Um, it's been reclassified or the the, um, the species name has been changed from Lloydia to Gagia. Uh, so it's uh, like a star of Bethlehem in the family. Um, but yes, yeah, Snowdonia it's found in a couple of places, six locations in Snowdonia, nowhere else in Britain, but I've seen it in the Alps, um, you see it in, in uh, the Rockies as well. So it's got a population, a world population outside of, of Britain, but in Britain it's only found in Snowdonia. So it's the only Arctic Alpine species in Britain that's not found in Scotland. So it's something unique for us here. And then two places in uh, North Wales where we see this flower, Mountain Avens, which is another beautiful flower, We've got eight petals, huge, huge flowers that track the sun 
um, live on the south facing aspects, which is unusual for these, these cold loving species. Um, you find that in the Arctic and in the Alps. You find that in the Arctic and the Alps. So these, they're either from an Arctic origin or an Alpine origin, but North Wales and Britain was at the extent of both of those um, kind of uh, regions um, glacially. And so we've got representatives from Alps and we've got representatives from the Arctic. So we've lumped them together as Arctic Alpine flowers and they're remnant from this cold period. So in terms of conservation, they're very, very highly valued. The lake, shallow gravels, mountain lakes, no input from um, agriculture. So they're very low in nutrients. And where it's really clear and undisturbed, you get some wonderful flowers. Quill worts of, uh, of rare, um, they're a, a spore plant and they're related to, um, club mosses and, and mosses and those lower plants, we call them lower, these ancient plants. And then you get water lobelia, um, shoreweed, and you'll find these flowering. Um, and you see the flowers above uh, the, water, the water level, but the, the plants themselves look fairly similar until you look really, really closely. These get washed up on the beach, so you can pick them after they've been picked, after they've been washed up on the beach. So I don't know if you can see in here, but there is a circle of stones. So in terms of culture and history, um, the first settlers to, 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 to live in Britain who, who weren't hunter-gatherers were known as the Neolithic. And they started to settle and start primitive agriculture and, and start to clear land. So our land that we see, this grassland, um, didn't always, wasn't always that way it's been deforested over 5,000 years and this is a hut circle an iron age sometime around 2,000 two and a half thousand years maybe um, a representation would look something like that so there's evidence of these in the mountains um, across all of our uplands in the UK Tin Can Alley a lot of people ask what Tin Can Alley is and it is um, it's a quarry. It was, um, I'm not sure if it, uh, how much of this is true, if it was developed when they were built, when Telford was building the road in 1815, but certainly in the 19th century, these quarries um, popped up. There's, I, I know there's one on Shabod, there's, um, there's various ones in the Northern Carnedai. Um, and the quarrymen were after a stone of a certain grade, which would be used as a whetstone to sharpen tools and sharpen blades, industrial blades. Um, so known as a hone stone quarry, and it's volcanic ash, a very, very fine grained ash um, that would uh, just help in that process. So it's a, a hone stone quarry. In terms of Commidwell, you've seen these fence lines. Um, this is the original enclosure. Um, the, the very, the oldest part of this, there's some fence posts just in here and it covered around this moraine here from the sixties. And then there's another post here, there's one here and around. They, they, they made a slightly larger enclosure in the seventies. And then I'm not sure exactly the date but then the one that we, we walk past today, um, you can see a, a kind of sequence of, of um, uh, kind of development really uh, in, in terms of removing sheep grazing pressure and showing what happens to the vegetation. So they've done as experimental plots from the University of Bangor. Um, they've run their course now, the research has been done, but the evidence is really clear. You've got birch trees, there's willow trees, um, there's all sorts of regeneration. Um, and Commidwell itself, the area that we know within the coup is, uh, is been shepherded and has gone through this uh, a process of wilding um, since 1999. So there's no grazing within this. As you come up to the edge of the lake, there's a wall that runs up here. And then there's the wall on the other side of the lake at that side. And where the photo is taken from is within this site, which is protected. Beyond that, 
and by the end of the lake, that's still grazed, it's still managed. Um, there's a, a warden, Simon, who's just absolutely brilliant. If you get a chance to go and knock on his door, say hello to him, the friendliest bloke. Uh, I've spent some really lovely walks uh, with him in, er, in Commidwell. Just he's come out when I've had groups to talk about management and just a brilliant advocate for, for land stewardship and land management. Um, so he's the, the Idwell uh, officer. Uh, Fantastic. He's just so, so approachable. I can't rate him highly enough. Um, in terms of agriculture, I said th the land is still managed. It's still important to graze. Um, if you wild an area, it still needs to, it, you can't just leave an area to go fallow. Um, it doesn't have the right consequences um, for the vegetation. So um, agriculture is used in conservation management but it's also just part of the upland landscape. So sheep grazing, uh, massive increase since the 1950s. Um, ponies, uh, Shetland ponies are, are really useful in, in managing rushes in the wetter parts of, of the upland. So they're used in conservation, but also just um, to control the spread of the rushes. Cows, they are such a welcome sight back in the mountains. They have such an important role in, 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 in the landscape. Um, they, they graze in a very, very different way from the close cropping mouths of the, the sheep. They trample a lot more, they compact the soil, they, they have an impact, massive impact on bracken as well. So, you know, they're, they're, they're all very useful. And then there's a wild population of feral goats, which have been around since the probably um, the uh, Iron Age time, maybe even earlier than the Iron Age, but they were um, farmed goats, which are now feral. There's about 157 of them in the glitters. Um, and there is a control of them. Uh, their population is quite high at the moment, and the, there is a, a management to keep their numbers um, at a, a, a certain level. So we're just gonna run through a couple of habitats to finish off with. So wetlands, really important part of, of the mountains. You've got um, sedges, cottontail, um, mare's tail, cotton grass, which is a sedge. In the bogs and the, and the damp areas, you've got sphagnum, which is absolutely uh, critical for, for holding water and, and releasing it slowly into the river. So that's a really important um, flood control. Flowers that you might see, um, lousewort. It's a, uh, it's it's able to photosynthesize, but it's also quite happy to nick its food from the roots of grasses. So it's a hemiparasitic plant, lousewort, thought to give cows lice, but that's that's not uh, shown to be correct. Bog bean, beautiful white hairy flowers that you'll see in in uh, June time, May June. Sundew, if you look very closely, you see these um, modified rounded leaves with these sticky tentacles and they absorb the, the nutrients from insects. So bogs and wetlands are, are poor in nutrients, which are, are not available. The nutrients are locked up, but they're not available to the plant. So these um, innovative ideas for, for surviving in, in these wet areas. And then bog aspidal which is just a most stunning flower in July. It's got tinged with orange. Uh, it's been used as a saffron substitute. Um, they're, they're just a, a look at wetland species to feast your eyes. Heather moorlands, Britain's got 75% of the world's heather moorlands. Thyme, if you, you walk across an area of thyme, it's just the scent is just magnificent. Tormental in the rose family is, is uh, uh, if you're tormented by an illness, apparently it's rich in tannins and it's really good to, to settle an upset stomach. So if you're tormented by illness or torment ill. There's bilberry, ling heather, milkwort and bell heather. So these are common in our, our moorlands. But again, you have to look very closely. They're, they're very small. And you have to get them quite low to see the flowers themselves. And then just to finish off with, we'll look at um, the mountaintops. Um, 
up there you've got the hardiest of the hardy plants you've got the lichens and the mosses which are able to survive without soil um, just an incredibly barren environment at the high mountains but you do get Britain's smallest tree so this is willow dwarf willow this is female these are female seed pods all you see above ground are the leaves all the branches and the twigs and stems are all and the roots are all underground and again if you look very closely on the glitters or on around a garden and carnevi you'll see areas of this you see the little leaves um, and one plant a very long life about 150 years maybe could occupy an area of a meter square so again very specialized plant you get crowberry and cowberry so crowberry it's got the, the little white line on the underside it's rolled in leaf and the cowberry with a wide wide leaf there so they're high in the mountains uh, just uh, just amazing what natural history there is in in north wales um, as I said, that was just wrapping up some of the habitats that you find and the species. So um, hopefully I'm going to be running a series of webinars this spring, not quite finalised, but um, Woodlands in Winter, a Geology of the World, so Paul Gannon, Upland Birds, Sophie Lee Williams um, is an eagle, she's an ornithologist in introducing, uh, she's the project officer for the introducing eagles to uh, Wales. She's an ornithologist, going to talk about upland birds. Uh, Simon, who I've just mentioned, the warden at um, Idwal, he's going to give a talk on management. Now we're in the post-EU period. What's going to happen to our, our land management? It's really exciting. So it's not just a Wales uh, perspective, but he's going to give an overview of that. Um, and then I'll wrap up running one on wild food and foraging when all the flowers are starting to pop out. So, um, yeah. I do run CPD when I'm not doing online courses. Uh, I run do walks and, and courses. And I've got a range of, of educational cards and um, I've got a nature trail for Commidwell, um, playing card sets. And I co-authored a book, The Alps, A Natural Companion with Paul Gannon, um, who's written about rock trails. So there's various books and products that if you'd like to look on my website, um, then uh, you can purchase those from there. Um, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves this evening. Um, I'm going to have a, a chance to look at any comments and, and things um, at the end of this. I'm going I'm to sign off in a second. Um, but I hope if you do did enjoy yourselves, uh, you know any comments would be re really gratefully received. Um, and um, yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure for me to give this talk tonight, and I hope you've got a lot from it uh, on a on a windy and wet evening in February. So um, yeah, have a lovely evening, everybody, and I hope to see you all again at some point. Okay, bye bye for now. Thank you.